allow me to ask you a question before we begin this lesson. Can you identify what is being shown here on the screen? Yes, you are right. This is the Qutub Minar. And where is this Qutub Minar located? I suppose most of you must have already visited Qutub Minar on your trip to Delhi. So, Qutub Minar is located in Delhi. Now, why are we suddenly talking about Qutub Minar? This is because Qutub Minar is one of the most beautiful and splendid architectures that we have in our country. Now, at one time, India was synonymous with its glorious architectures, with its architectural marvels. Now, in this lesson, we will discuss the various architectures, architectures in the form of monuments, temples, mosques that were built between the 8th and the 18th centuries. So, now let us plunge headlong into discussing these architectures and how these were built. So, with this, we begin our discussion on rulers and buildings. So, let us begin this discussion with the Qutub Minar. The Qutub Minar is located in Delhi. It is a five-story high minaret and under the arches of the first balcony, inscriptions are done in Arabic. It is a splendid and marvelous piece of architecture. It is high and it is great. When you go to visit Delhi, you must never leave out visiting the Qutub Minar. Now, while we discuss the Qutub Minar, we have to understand the historical period or the time frame when this was constructed. It was the slave or the Mamluk Sultan Qutubuddin Aibak who began the construction of the Qutub Minar in the year 1199. So, remember this that Qutubuddin Aibak began the construction of or he laid the foundation of the Qutub Minar in the year 1199. And what did he construct? He could construct only the first floor of this magnificent minaret because soon after he died. So, the construction of Qutub Minar was started by Qutubuddin Aibak. Now, Qutubuddin Aibak was succeeded by Iltutmish. So, Iltutmish was another sultan of the Mamluk or the slave dynasty and it was Iltutmish who constructed the rest of this building. So, keep this in mind that in the year 1199, Qutubuddin Aibak began the construction of the Qutub Minar and he could build only the first floor of this minaret and it was Il Tutmish who constructed the rest of the building by the year 1229. But the Qutub Minar, you have to understand, was built many, many years ago. That is to say, it was built centuries ago. Now, this minaret stood against the ravages of time. Subsequently, it was damaged by earthquakes, by lightnings. But do you think that this minaret was let to fall into pieces? Never so, because it has been one of the most glorious pieces of architecture that we get to witness in our country and the sultans of the subsequent dynasties of the Delhi Sultanate could not let this minaret go into pieces. Which is why this Qutub Minar that was started by Qutubuddin Aibak and finished by Il Tutmish was subsequently repaired by few other sultans. Let us now find out the names of the sultans who repaired the Qutub Minar. Firstly, it was Alauddin Khalji of the Khalji dynasty who played a major role in repairing and reconstructing this Qutub Minar. After that, we have Muhammad Tughlaq and Firuz Shah Tughlaq of the Tughlaq dynasty who also undertook construction works of this Qutub Minar. And last but not the least, Sultan Ibrahim Lodi of the Lodi dynasty also constructed and repaired Qutub Minar. So, Keep this in mind that the Qutub Minar was built primarily by Qutubuddin Aibak and Il Tutmish and it was repaired by Alauddin Khalji, Muhammad Tughlaq, Firuz Shah Tughlaq and Ibrahim Lodi. And these sultans were belonging to different dynasties under the Delhi Sultanate. And now let us find out more about the architectural qualities of the Qutub Minar. So now let us zoom in on the Qutub Minar. Here you can see a portion of the Qutub Minar that has been zoomed in on for our discussion. What do you see here? 
you see the various arches that were built under the balcony of the first floor. This is a point that we have already discussed that this Kutub Minar is 5 stories high and it has several arches under the balcony. And on these arches you can see inscriptions are engraved in Arabic. So what you see here are inscriptions that are made in Arabic. Now why are these inscriptions of any importance to us? Because these inscriptions rattle out and tell us more about the history behind this minaret. Now what do we get to know from these inscriptions that are made on the arches under the balcony? Now what do these inscriptions made in Arabic tell us? These inscriptions tell us why this Qutub Minar was constructed in the first place. From these inscriptions we get to know that this Qutub Minar was constructed to celebrate Muslim dominance in Delhi after the defeat of the last Hindu ruler. Along with that we also get to know why the Qutub Minar is named so. Now you must be thinking that the Qutub Minar is called the Qutub Minar because Qutubuddin Abak began its construction. No. From these inscriptions we get to know that Qutubuddin Abak began the construction of this minaret in the memory of the Sufi saint Khwaja Qutubuddin Bhakti Akaki and it is from the name of the Sufi saint that this minaret is named. Now a very important and interesting thing that we can see from this portion that is zoomed in is that the surface of the building is curved and angular. Now take a close look at this. On this curved and angular surface, inscriptions are made. Now today, instead of writing or making inscriptions on walls, we write on papers. Now let me give you an example. I give you two pieces of paper to write on. While on the one hand, I give you a flat piece of paper, as flat as your book or copy is. On the other hand, I give you a piece of paper that is rolled, so that this paper is now curved. Now which piece of paper will you choose to write on? Most definitely the flat one because it's easier to write on a flat surface than a curved surface. Whenever we write on something be that a notebook or a book or a copy, we use a flat surface to write. We never write on curved surfaces because it's very difficult to write anything on a curved surface. Now can you imagine how difficult it must have been for the architects to inscribe on this carved and angular walls? And for this purpose alone only the most skilled craftspersons could inscribe on this curved and angular walls. This is an architectural singularity that we have to keep in mind when we have to discuss and understand the splendor of the Qutub Minar. Now let us discuss another construction that we find in the central part of our country. The Qutub Minar as we learnt was constructed by Qutubuddin Abak who belonged to the Delhi Sultanate. But what do we have here? We are now coming to the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. And in the state of Madhya Pradesh let us now focus on an architecture that was made by a king who belonged to the Chandela dynasty. What was this king known as? The name of this king was King Dhanga Deva who belonged to the Chandela dynasty and ruled from 950 to 999. And in a place called Khajuraho that is located in the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh, he built a magnificent temple. What is this temple called? This temple is known as the Kandarya Mahadeva temple. And in this Kandarya Mahadeva temple, the main deity is Lord Shiva. That is to say, this Kandarya Mahadeva temple is dedicated to Lord Shiva and it was constructed in the year 999 by King Dhanga Deva who belonged to the Chandela dynasty. What you see here is the magnificent Kandarya Mahadeva temple. Isn't this amazing? It's a brilliant piece of architecture and this name Kandarya Mahadeva temple literally means the great god of the cave. So the great god of the cave is what this temple's name means. And you have to keep in mind that this Kandarya Mahadeva temple is one of the most beautiful and ornate Hindu temples that were found in the medieval period in Khajuraho, Madhya Pradesh. So in this lesson by now we have learnt about two great architectural pieces. One is the Qutub Minar and the other is the Kandarya Mahadeva temple.
Now let us zoom in on this Kandariya Mahadeva temple and see what architectural characteristics it had and how it was similar to other temples that were built in and around that period. The Kandariya Mahadeva temple has a similar architecture to many temples that were built during that period. Now what is that architectural singularity that we need to focus on? We have to understand that the temple has an ornamented gateway and this gateway leads to an entrance and the Mahamandapa where dances were performed. Now let us focus on this image so that we can understand the architecture or the characteristic of this Kandariya Mahadeva temple in greater detail. What do we have here? We have the main entrance and from there this main entrance leads to the Mahamandapa. Why were Mahamandapa significant? Because in this Mahamandapa dances were performed that is dances that were devoted to the deity that was being worshipped in the temple. So in this Mahamandapa dances were performed. Now what do we have after the Mahamandapa? The Mahamandapa then leads to the Garbhagriha. Now what is a Garbhagriha? A Garbhagriha is the main shrine of the temple. It is the place where the image or the idol of the chief deity was placed. So here's the entrance and then visitors go to the Mahamandapa where dances were performed and that Mahamandapa then leads to the Garbhagriha which is the main shrine of the temple. And in the Garbhagriha the main deity was worshipped. Now you have to keep another thing in mind that in the Garbhagriha only the king and his close people that is his nobles or people who belong to his family could only enter for ritual worship. So ritual worship or the worship of the main deity happened inside the Garbhagriha. Now let us come to the outside of the temple and see what we have there. Now this temple had the topmost point that was called the Shikhara. In a later lesson, we will discuss the Shikhara in greater detail. But for now, let us understand that the topmost point of the temple was known as the Shikhara. Shikhara directly means the top of something, which is why the top of the temple was known as Shikhara. And with that, we also have the Vimana. What is the Vimana? In our lesson on rulers and buildings, we have already discussed the Vimana. The Vimana is a large pyramidical tower that is made above the main shrine. So the main shrine is the Garbhagriha where the chief deity was placed and on the top of that main shrine, this pyramidical tower was made which was known as the Vimana. So this is the way in which temples in medieval India were constructed. Now let us find out about more architectures that were built during that period. Before continuing with this lesson, let me ask you a question quickly so as to ensure that you have your concepts clear. Where can you find the main deity in medieval temples? Can you find it in the Vimana, the Shikhara, the Garbhagriha or the Mahamandapa? Yes, you are right. The main deity was placed in the Garbhagriha. So the Garbhagriha constituted the main shrine of medieval temples. So all this while we have discussing about the Kandariya Mahadeva temple which is also known as the Khajuraho temple because it was built in this place called Khajuraho in the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. We just discussed in detail the architecture of this temple. From this we learned that only people from the royal family that is the king and his family members could enter the Garbhagriha which was the place of ritual worship. Now in this Khajuraho complex there were several royal temples and in this royal temples commoners were not allowed to enter. So the royal temples meant exclusive access for the royal people only that is to say the king and his family members. Commoners were not allowed in the Khajuraho complex or the various royal temples. Now with that we also have to understand that this Khajuraho temple is a world heritage site. But what makes this temple a world heritage site? There were many temples built during the medieval period but what makes this one temple very unique and what makes this one temple a world heritage site? This is because these temples are decorated with elaborately carved skulls.
sculptures. It's a beautiful, it's a marvelous thing to behold these temples because these temples have elaborately carved sculptures on the walls and this makes the Khajuraho temple a world heritage site. Now let us discuss in detail the various kind of structures that were built by the kings that is the various types of constructions that the kings did. So let us now focus our discussion on the kinds of constructions that were built by the kings. The period we are focusing on in this discussion is from the 8th to the 18th century and during this period two kinds of structures were built by the kings. Now what divided these two kinds of structures? These two kind of structures had very different purposes which is why these two kinds of structures had very different purposes which is why we divide these two types of structures for our discussion. Now on the one hand we have the construction of forts, palaces, garden residences and tombs. Now by hearing the names of forts, palaces, garden residences and tombs, can you tell me one thing that is common in all these? Yes, you are right. All these structures or all these constructions were meant for private uses. So the kings built forts to stay there. They also built palaces, garden residences and tombs for their private purposes. Palaces and garden residences were places that were built by the kings for staying and forts were constructed by the kings so as to ensure the defense of their territory. And why were tombs constructed? Tombs were constructed to bury the deceased people. So these constructions were for private purposes and these were built by the kings. And on the other hand we have the construction of temples, mosques, tanks, wells and bazaars. Now what is similar among all these constructions? Yes, you are right. These were meant for the public. So, these constructions that is forts, palaces, garden residences and tombs were meant for private purposes and temples, mosques, tanks, wells and bazaars were places where the people or the masses had access to. Here you can see a fort. A fort is meant for the king alone. But a mosque or a bazaar is not restricted to a king or the royal family alone. These are places where the public can also go. A mosque is a place where people gather to offer their prayers to God and simultaneously a bazaar is a place where people gather to perform trade, to buy and sell things. So these places were public places. Now do you think that only the kings made various constructions during the medieval period? Now if we say it so, we will be wrong because the merchants or traders also made their constructions which were known as Havelis. Now what are Havelis? A Haveli is a huge manor house. It's a huge mansion that were built in the Indian subcontinent during the medieval period. And at which time or during which period were the Havelis made? The Havelis gained prominence during the Mughal period. And why did merchants or traders build these Havelis? They built these Havelis for residential purposes. That is to say, these huge manor houses, these huge mansions were built by the merchants for them to stay. Now in these images you can see two Havelis. This is a Haveli from the outside you can see how huge this mansion is and this you can see is a courtyard or an open balcony inside a Haveli. This is also a magnificent piece of architecture because Havelis have stood the test of time and if you go to visit Rajasthan or Gujarat you will be able to visit some Havelis at the least. Now the merchants did not make this huge mansions called Havelis only for staying. These Havelis were then made close to the markets because the merchants tried their best to increase their trade 
and to increase their trade or perform trade very efficiently they required to station themselves near the markets and for the purpose of staying close to the markets these traders or merchants during the Mughal period mostly built these huge mansions called Havelis. So from this lesson we got to learn that not just the kings but traders and merchants also made their own constructions. But these constructions were made hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And even today many of such constructions still exist. Now you must be wondering how these constructions have stood the ravages of time. Because with so many years, floods, earthquakes, lightnings could have destroyed these constructions. But the structures are still intact. Now to understand this, we have to discuss how these constructions were made. That is what made these structures so strong and so powerful that they lasted for centuries. With this, we have to now discuss these structures from a technological point of view. Now, it is imperative on our part to keep this point in mind that very skilled craftspersons and very skilled men existed during this time because all these structures were huge in size and to make a huge structure last for many years, in fact centuries in this case, it needs to be built very strongly. Now, what technologies were implemented by the craftspersons who were working then? Obviously, they did not have access to the technologies that we have today. But you will be surprised to know that the technologies they used during that period are something that we cannot even imagine of. So, what were those technologies? Now, to understand those technologies, now let us begin our discussion on a superstructure. Now, what is a superstructure? A superstructure is a part of a building that is made above the ground floor. Now consider this is the ground level and what is made above this will be known as the superstructure. So this is a superstructure and to have a strong superstructure, a strong foundation required to be made. This foundation was something that was built below the ground. So above the ground we have the superstructure and below the ground we have this foundation that was known as the substructure. Now considering we are making a structure or a building only of one story. So we have just four walls to make. It will be easier in that case. But now considering we need to build more stories that is add more stories to that building that is it will have a ground floor, a second floor and more floors on top of it and above everything a roof it needs to be built very properly because without proper planning of a construction it will crumble that is it will fall into pieces it will not stay together for a long time so to build many floors above the ground that is to build a strong superstructure various kinds of technologies required to be implemented and few of such technologies are something that we will now begin discussing let us now go back in time and look at buildings that were built between the 7th and the 10th centuries. What do we see here? During this period, the buildings that were made included more rooms, more roofs, more doors and more windows. Now in order to make a building huge in size and add more rooms, roofs, doors and windows to it, proper planning is required. What you see here is the Hawa Mahal that you can see in Jaipur. If you visit the Hawa Mahal, you will be able to see that it has many, many rooms in that one building. And many rooms mean many roofs and many rooms mean many doors, many windows and many rooms also mean that there will be many floors, which is why there will be many roofs. Now, how was this building along with many other buildings built during this period? These buildings were built in a style that is known as the trebiate or the corbelled style. Now what a trebiate or the corbelled style is that we will come to later. For now keep this in mind that these buildings that were built between the 7th and the 10th centuries with more rooms, roofs, doors and windows were constructed in a style that is known as the trebiate or the corbelled style. Now let us time travel and move a few centuries ahead 
we come to the 8th to the 13th centuries. What we find here is that between this period as well, the strabiate or corbel style was used to build temples, mosques and various buildings that were attached to large stepped wells. What were these wells known as? These wells were known as baulis. What you see here is the Rajoke Bauli that you can find in Delhi. Now the image that comes to our mind when we think of a well is something like this. There is one cylindrical structure that is made above the ground and below the ground we have the well where water is stored. But contrary to our idea of a well, large steeped wells that were known as Baulis were made between the 8th and 13th centuries. These Baulis had large steps and people used to get access to the water in these wells by climbing down these stairs. And so the buildings that were attached to these baulis were also made in the trebiate or corbel style. Now we have discussed at sufficient length the time periods that is 7th to 10th centuries and 8th to 13th centuries when buildings were constructed in the trebiate style. Now it's imperative on a part to find out what this trebiate or corbel style means. Now the strabiate or corbel style was required or it was implemented to make doors, windows and roofs. Now in this style or in this architectural type, horizontal beams were placed across two vertical columns. Now think of it this way, you have two vertical columns across which is placed a horizontal beam and this arrangement or this style is known as a trabiate or a corbel style. For the purpose of your understanding, we have an image here. You can see two vertical columns and these columns were known as post. And the horizontal beam that was placed across these vertical columns was known as lintel. So these vertical columns were known as posts and these posts or these vertical columns were then supported by this horizontal beam that was known as a lintel. Here you can see a roof that is made in the corbett style. Now we have understood what the strabiate or corbel style means. Now let us see how it is implemented to hold together a roof in a different kind of arrangement that still makes use of the strabiate or corbel style we have two beams and these horizontal beams have kept together or they are holding together the roof. So the roof is not falling apart because these beams are holding the roofs together. Now, If you visit the northern part of any old city like Delhi or Kolkata, you will be able to see how the strabiate or corbel style was used to hold together the roofs. In this way, these beams were used to keep the roof in place. Now with this, we have understood how the buildings or the structures that were built during the medieval period have stood tall even today. Now let us find out about another architectural singularity that has also been very important in holding together huge buildings, in holding together huge structures. This brings us to a discussion on arches. You can see some arches on this building here. The arches or this acute architectural form started being used from the 12th century. Now what are arches? In these arches, a semicircular structure is made. Now what are arches made for? These arches are very important to hold the weight of the building above. In this image, you can see this building above or the weight of this building above is being held by this arch. And for this reason, you can understand that this acute architectural form or the use of arches gained prominence and importance during the 12th century. But you will be surprised to know that arches were also of different kinds. Let us find out about the various kinds of arches that were built during this period. During this period, two kinds of arches were made. What were these arches known as? One form was known as the true arch and the other was the corbel arch. Now what is the difference between a true arch and a corbel arch? In a true arch, as you can see here, there is a center keystone. And 
the center keystone is then supported by other stones that are placed vertically so the center keystone and stones placed vertically together make up this true arch and contrary to this we have another type that is known as the corbel arch so how is a corbel arch different from a true arch in a true arch we have a center keystone but in the corbel arch we don't have a center keystone instead we have all the stones placed horizontally all the stones here are placed horizontally there is no center keystone here as you can see in the case of a true arch so these two kinds of arches were built during the 12th century in the architectural form that was known as the arcuate architectural form and we have also understood the reason why these arches were built these arches were built to hold the weight of the building or the structure above these arches were very important for this reason because during this period the buildings that were made were huge in size and a huge building will also be very heavy and something needs to be made to keep or hold the weight and for this purpose arches of these two kinds that is true arch and corbel arch were made as a quick recap let us go over the various architectural styles that we discussed and how they were important in holding together huge buildings firstly we talked about the trabeater corbel style and then we came to discussing arches now what were these buildings made of we understood that trabeater corbel style was required to make roofs doors windows arches were also required to hold the weight of the buildings but what were these buildings made of it was during this period that is from the 12th century limestone cement was gaining importance that is to say limestone cement was being increasingly used in the making of buildings now why was limestone cement being used because limestone cement was very hard and limestone cement was made by mixing limestone on the one hand and stone chips on the other hand and together limestone and stone chips made up limestone cement this limestone cement was very hard it gave a concrete structure to the buildings and for this reason that is by using limestone cement now the construction of large structures became easier and faster because prior to this limestone cement was not used and now around the 12th century when people discovered the use of limestone cement and how hard this limestone cement can be this now started being used in the construction of buildings and so with the use of limestone cements huge buildings were constructed very easily and very fastly so in this discussion we talked about the various kinds of architectures that were being built between the 8th and the 18th centuries now this lesson was devoted to understanding only the architectural values of these buildings that is to say how these buildings were important as architectures how these buildings were crafted to perfection and how these buildings stood the ravages of time in a subsequent lesson we will try to discuss how these buildings were important as not just pieces of architecture but in other ways as well Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. get all your doubts resolved instantly learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and ipads so at delta step learning is not just fun and easy it's rewarding too so register for free now